Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So today's interview is with Father Martin Molesky. He's professor of religious studies at Catholic Theology at Kinesis College in Buffalo. He has become a friend of mine over the last few years and has written a biography, co-written a biography on Michael Polanyi, a guy that I studied in my uh, master's degree at the University of Guelph. And Polanyi didn't coin the phrase, I suppose, but he certainly wrote a great deal at great length about this idea of human knowing and personal knowledge, something he called tacit knowing. It's about what he would call, or what uh, Father Molesky talks about, sinking into the tacit dimension. It's about practicing, it's about absorbing, it's about focusing on, and this idea that knowledge is here, it's in us, it's 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 how we make contact with reality. Father Molesky talks about surplus meaning in the master-disciple relationships and about the value of the inexact. You're going to love it. He's great. He's interesting. Lots of good stuff here with plenty of application, and he has a, an essay in a new book that I've published recently called Irreconcilable Differences. It's called of essays. Check it out. It's on Amazon. Irreconcilable Differences. You're going to enjoy this interview. I know it. See you soon. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We have a, for me, a very special guest here today. We have Father Martin Molesky from Kinesis College in Buffalo. Thanks for joining us today. It's my pleasure. He is the author of Michael Polanyi, Scientist and Philosopher. It's a several hundred page biography. Oh, I'm on... not the author. I'm the co-author. <laughs> the co-author. It Co-later? It was begun by Bill Scott in okay. 1977, and he worked on it for 17 years. Wrote 293,000 words, about 1,200 pages in manuscript. Did 150 interviews on tape. And wow, I knew traveled it was many times big. to Europe. Yes, it was an immense project. He was a physicist. Polanyi had done his science in medicine and physical chemistry. So Bill Scott and Michael Polanyi spoke the language of science as well as the language of philosophy together. But Bill grew old as he worked on this project. Uh, Polanyi died in 76. Scott started the biography in 77. And in 1994, um, his wife had to concede that he was not going to be able to mm. rewrite what he had written. And uh, in 1997, I came in, and she allowed me to be co-author. At this time, Bill was dying of complications mm. of Parkinson's disease. Right. And uh, she gave me freedom to rework his material. Yeah, I mean, that to me is an interview in itself. Yeah. <laughs> Just talking about the process that you must have gone through. How do you edit that? How do you redact it? Where do you begin? I began right? by uh, bringing it all into standard format. So what do we got? We got shoe boxes, file folders, cassette tapes. Everything. <laughs> and Brown paper in the bags. years between 1977 and 1994, the manuscript had traveled through every version of hardware and software. Mm, right, of course. You know, from the Apple II yeah, yeah. up to the latest PC. Right, right. The <laughs> Commodore 164, <laughs> right. is that right? Is that what it was or something like that? Oh, Apple II, I think, funny. was the first one. And then, oh, that's so you know, funny. Wow. So, so but, quite the project. Oh, it was, it was, this was hard. Just yeah, simply uh, putting all the footnotes into footnote format and standardizing the references, wow. simply Real. producing sure. a respectable edition of what he had written yeah. so that I could start from that and then cut and paste and reorganize. So what's amazing to me, uh, so uh, I've certainly, I've written on Michael Polanyi, I did my master's thesis on him, I, and, mm. and we're going to hopefully talk a little bit about him, the person, yes. and maybe his family and his life and what, what his thinking comes out of, but but for me, his his... His work kind of touches on so many uh, levels for me. So I'm a, I'm a sleight of hand magician, so I do card tricks. 
I'm an electrician by trade. I still carry my non-union, or sorry, my unionized card. I pay my non-working dues. <laughs> so I'm an electrician, very tacit environment, right. magician, very tacit environment. And now yes. I work in the international development sector, which requires a certain, I believe, intuitive or participatory kind of like approach that has to be tacit in some way. There's no rubric for that. Right. There's no, right. there's no, you know, my students uh, think I'm nuts when I want them to help me define a word. They just want the definition. Right. And I want right. to draw it out. In, so, in all of those areas, you need feel, you sensitivity, a uh, sense of how the whole is coming across and as well as um, a tacit understanding of, in the uh, magic and in your teaching and in the area of your expertise as a teacher, you are summing up all kinds of uh, inputs and considerations, right. keeping track of many things simultaneously, not in focal awareness. Focus, uh, focal and background, this is part of Polanyi's epistemology, that uh, anything that we can hold in focus is always in a larger context. And the larger context is what we know tacitly. Well, well and, and, and for a development worker, it's all about context. Mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, who, 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 I mean, isn't it about context for all of us? Yeah. <laughs> well, now, you the know? electrician's context, I think I've done a little bit of electrical work. Yes. You have to keep some things in mind, but I think there are probably more rules and regulations. You, you're counting the number of wires, you know the number yeah, of Yeah, no, I, and I think, I think it comes down to the whole relationship between you and your tools, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, your hand tools, the screwdrivers, oh, the pliers. Oh, yes, or oh, feel for how, the, to, how oh, tight to torque things. A hundred percent, What's yeah. a safe amount? With, without a doubt. And then I think where the tacit really comes to play uh, in a construction worker or an electrician or a plumber, I would imagine, is the troubleshooting. Yeah. Oh my right? heavens. Oh, so problem you, you walk into a house and yeah. we've got some crazy issue with lights coming on and off and you're thinking, okay, what is this? Do we have evil spirits in this house? <laughs> yeah. Greml gremlins? What's up? Right. And, as, and it's only, I think, the experience that you bring to bear in the situation Absolutely. that allows you to charge what you charge right. and actually hopefully find the problem. Right. And you don't even know how much you know. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. all of your past experience. That's right. Is brought to bear. Do, do you know what I love? I mean, I'm, we're close to 100 interviews now that I've done on face to face, and I've had many people say to me afterwards, after interviews, a day later or two days, or even after the interview, David, you, you brought stuff out of me that I didn't even know. You know <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing right, here, but right. I didn't even know I had it. Or I didn't, right. you know, I've had people sit down with their notes. Yeah, and not refer to their notes at all. Sure, and I and I've had to say, hey, it's all here. As I point to their your interviewers, are, the people that you're interviewing are are saying this that you brought yes, things out I'm, of them. So I, what I'm saying yeah. is, this they've got this. They they don't know what they know. Right. Now, right. For the sake of your poor suffering audience. Yes, please. We need to define. We this. should talk about so, what so is me, tacit. What, what the hell is this thing anyway? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, let, so let me get this slogan off my chest. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All knowledge is tacit or rooted in tacit knowing. This is Polanyi's great maxim. And the word tacit means silent. It's the kind of knowledge that is real, but can't be put into words, can't be turned into a formula, can't be completely mechanized. It's, it's human knowing. Mm. He calls it personal knowledge, rather than say like machine knowledge or artificial intelligence where it stands today. And um, the other kind of knowledge is articulate. Those things that you can write down in formulas where you can, in geometry, it's so beautiful. Every step in a proof, you explain, here's the next step and here's my reason for thinking it's the right, uh, a sound inference, going from one line to the next. And you come to the bottom of a geometric proof, you draw the line and you say, quad est demonstratum. I've demonstrated what I set out to demonstrate. So that's articulate knowledge, formal knowledge. Tacit knowledge, as you said, is intuitive, deep, um, something that we, we don't even know how much we know, like you're the people that you interviewed. It's in me, and I use it all the time. I rely on it. I so trust root, it. So help me out here. Root this in an example. It's uh, it's 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 rowing a boat. It's riding a bike. Riding a I love riding yeah, a bike. Hammering a nail. Yeah. Okay. And the riding a bike example. Do you know if you're falling to the right on a bicycle, how do you keep yourself from falling <laughs> and put your, your putting your foot on the ground? I hopefully don't overreact. 
<laughs> yeah, but what do you do with the handlebars? If you're I falling mean, to the right, feel yourself yeah, now. Lean yeah, to the right. Yeah, I guess I... Do I turn them a little to the left, maybe? No, because if you do that, you fall flat on your face. Really? You're falling to the... Yes, see, so see, I, you I know this, but yeah. you don't know you know yeah, it. It's you, awesome. you, can't, yeah. you can't put it into words. I don't know, maybe I, I correct from the waist up. I, no, I don't you don't. Know. No, you don't. I would don't. have to watch myself on video, actually. You turn probably. the handlebars to the right in the direction that you're falling. And you can actually hear the tire scrub on the pavement. You'll hear it a little bit, you know. And the bicycle moves underneath you. You're falling to the right. The bicycle moves to the right underneath you and brings your body back upright. Wow. When you want to make a right-hand turn, how do you make a right-hand turn? I, I sort of move my body to the right. I don't know. No, you don't. <laughs> I don't know, no, actually. you don't. That's pretty funny. I've never... So I've, I've talked about this You've, example before, and I've never actually... You understood it, right? Not in, not in this way. No, that's awesome. That's no. fabulous. Okay. So you know it. how to ride... You do know how to ride a of bike, course, don't you? Yeah. Okay. Although it's being tested of late, because yeah. <laughs> I haven't ridden in years, and I'm back out with my son and oh. my daughter, and we're now exploring a little, and nice. it's interesting, nice. my, my fear and my reticence at sure. doing certain things just because I haven't... Okay, well, let me tell else. you how to make a right-hand turn. Okay, that's helpful. You turn the handlebar to the left. You turn them to the... Really? Yes, the bicycle goes off to the left. Your body starts falling to the right. Now you're falling to the right. How do you keep yourself from falling down? Flat on your face. You turn the handlebars to the right. And then you are in the middle of a right-hand turn. <laughs> Very nice. So f the first little jog to the I left... I would have failed this test on your... Uh, yes. This oh, question oh, on your test. Oh, oh, <laughs> Miserably. <laughs> but this is tacit knowing. Yeah, sure. Anybody who can ride a bike n discovers this for themselves. They get on the bike, they fall off. Get on the bike, fall off. Get on the bike, fall off. Get on the bike and accidentally pull the handlebars in the right direction and they feel, ah, oh, that kept me from falling off the bike. So, and there's got to be so many, I mean, at the risk of hopping to the next sure. uh, uh, practical application yeah. too quickly, so many applications for this. And, oh. and, you know, you used human knowing to me as wonderful. This every, idea of... every area where there's a skill involved, the, the uh, elements of the skill can be practiced. Oh, I don't know, let's say in basketball. You have to be able to dribble the ball. You have to be able to watch where people are on the court, predict where they're going to go, think of who's going to get open, how do you pass the ball, the different kinds of shots you take uh, from half court, from the foul line, under the basket, right-handed, left-handed. You know, are there maybe a dozen or 15 elements of basketball that you could practice? But when you are in the game, you must mm -hmm. not be thinking of these things focally. You must quickly sum up, where am I in the game? Do I dribble, do I pass, do I shoot? And make a decision that goes faster than the process of articulate thinking. And, or, or a, 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 a pianist, this is another right. great of course, example. Of course, yeah. Um, the pianist can't be thinking, and I'm now gonna move my ring finger, now my index finger. <laughs> Yes. Do you play? Do you use thumbs on the piano? You do indeed. Yeah. Gee. Okay. I haven't done enough piano playing <laughs> as I'm thinking about yeah. this. Yeah. And if you focus on the notes uh, and, and on the page, you're not really focused. Oh, you, know, you can you can hear a, you you're can hear a child learning. Yes. They're at that stage where yeah. every note is. Yeah. Very much so. Played where it belongs, but it's not it's not a song yet. It's not music yet. Yes. Yes. There has to be a forgetfulness, a, a sinking into the tacit dimension of the elements of the music that you've practiced so that there's a flow from one note to the next and one phrase, a whole, a whole set so, of notes. So how does next. this, um, how does something like this affect, um, the way I deal with people in the international development sector? How does this affect my relationship with you or my wife or my kids tacitly? What does tacit knowledge have to say about that? You or might it say about that? You can trust it. You can, you can rely on your uh, intuition, right. your feelings, where, which is summing up all kinds of inputs. You are reading people's body language, their tone of voice. You are remembering things beneath the level of consciousness, like your problem solving as an electrician. What other situations have I been in like this before? 
either dealing with a topic in international relations or dealing with the people who are involved in mm -hmm, mm -hmm, some mm -hmm, topic. Mm -hmm. you've, you've got all of these feelers out in your subconscious mind, which are directing your actions. In, in, in basketball, you want to score the basket, right? That thought. I'm going to try to score a basket or prevent a basket when you're on defense. Mm -hmm. That thought is the central focus, and everything else is coordinated by it. So doesn't that, though, presuppose a certain amount of, um, I don't know, I've read a lot of books, or I've experienced a whole lot of things, or... Um, it all adds up. It all adds it's up. It's all in you. Yeah. Everything you've experienced in your life is with you. <laughs> now, uh, I don't know how many languages I know. I don't know how many words I know in the languages I know. I mean, I've studied French and Spanish and Italian and German and Russian and Hebrew and Greek at least. So I can count seven off. You know. It's a lot of languages. Well, and I've looked at some others, you know, oh, a little bit of Hungarian. Okay. <laughs> Very little <Makes> bit. Sense. <laughs> because Michael Polanyi was Hungarian. Uh, and I know what I know about these languages. But I could never tell you how much I know. It's in me. It's right. active, and it could be, it can be um, drawn out by a question or some need that I have to, I don't know, find the meaning of a word in a passage, or to tease out possible meanings of a word in a passage. Things will come to mind. So the idea of a tacit library, as if you will, like based on experience and so on. Mm -hmm is like a library knowledge or a library value would be based on doing the hard work to some degree beforehand. So if you want sure. to be a good electrician or a good magician oh, yes. or a good doctor or surgeon, yeah. there has to be this groundwork. I mean, you're always going to be working tacitly by the sounds of it. Yeah. But in order to be better, to, be, to, to as Polanyi would say, and I want to talk about this in a second, the, right. the notion of indwelling right. and, and sort of exactly. being with all this stuff, you talked about sinking into the tacit dimension, which yeah. is a wonderful phrase. Yeah. But it's, it's learning to trust yourself in a sense. But in order to trust yourself, you have to do, I don't know, the student has to do the research. Oh, yes, the, absolutely. The practitioner has to practice. Right. The lawyer has to... The slogan is, all knowledge is tacit, silent, incapable of being put into words. Or it is rooted in right. tacit knowing. So there is articulate knowledge. There are formal things. There, are, there is a focus. We can bring things into consciousness. We, we can name and define various aspects of our lives, uh, say in, in mathematics especially. You cannot function without some kind of definition. Right. Uh, so so we, when it's not all tacit, but the tacit dimension is active and present even in our most formal, positive thinking. And, and the question for Planier was, I think, anyway, help me out here, but you're the guy who sifted through, what was it, how many interviews? <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, but we're, what are the implications now? So what does this now mean? If all knowledge is rooted in the tacit, what does this mean for the scientist? Well, I, what does it mean for the philosopher? Let's talk about and so indwelling and how you absorb a framework, how you enter into... And, and is it helpful, Marty, to keep the idea of, of falling off a bicycle in mind as we talk about this <laughs> and how you correct it? Well, how, how, you, how you made the discovery, yeah. the personal discovery where something clicked and, and you don't even know what you're doing, but now you're doing it right. Okay, you yourself know how to ride a bike, but you weren't capable of giving an adequate verbal description of it until I taught you uh, okay. the lesson. Right. Okay, so... Yes, let's go back. We, we have to practice, we have to absorb, and we, we're focusing, we bring into, the, into focus things that are necessary for the framework of magic, the framework of being an electrician, the framework of being a teacher, the framework of operating in the field of international relations. We, we have to absorb facts, names, dates, places, advice, uh, learn how to use the mm. tools of the trade, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. both things, uh, real physical tools or the right. conceptual tools. Sure. Um, if you do this, then uh, that will happen. So there are different magician's moves, you know, the sleight of hand. 
that a magician can say, here's how I do it. A, right. a, a, an elder magician who's made a discovery can pass that on to a younger magician. It's a master-disciple relationship. And Polanyi says this is true of every uh, framework that gives meaning to human life, uh, especially in science. You have to dwell in the preceding framework what scientists already know, what they have already discovered, the skills that they use in the laboratory, before you can break out of that framework and create a scientific revolution. First you absorb all of the lessons of the past and become a practitioner. Then you're in a position to revise, re-see the field. And uh, so there's this, this early phase of apprenticeship, being schooled, being taught by a master. And the master is using tacit knowledge in assessing where the apprentice is, summing up all of the information flowing through all of the senses, and all of the conversation, all of the, the uh, information that the person gives about what they know and what they don't know, to try to figure out where are they stuck and how do I help them. Right you know, make the next discovery or make the next step that's going to bring them to the point where they can really become a master themselves. Uh, there's a, an American scientist, Richard Feynman, who talked about this perplexity. He uh, is associated with quantum electrodynamics and he went and taught in Brazil and found that the students there were superb at memorizing hmm. verbal scientific formulas, but they had no feel for what they were talking about. No, no intuition, no picture, no imagination that corresponded to the definitions that they could rattle off and produce at will on a test. They, 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 they could talk science, but they couldn't think science. Right. And um, now I'm not sure, I actually haven't seen any Brazilian physicists testify to what a great teacher Feynman was, that he got them over this difficulty. <laughs> but, he, but he saw the difference between his own um, apprenticeship in science, which his father had, when he was a little boy, had given him a feel for how you imagine the realities that are being talked about. And his father wasn't a scientist, he was just a a man of good common sense, who, mm. a man mm. with, mm -hmm. with real wisdom. Right. You know, uh, Well, it man. sounds to me like you're uh, also talking about, you know, in the master-disciple relationship, uh, there doesn't have to be a sense of humility on both parts, but there definitely has to be a <laughs> sense of openness. I mean, as an apprentice electrician, I remember working with some guys who were pretty darn cocky and arrogant, and it was my way or the highway, and there uh -huh. was no... Uh -huh. There was no real grace or generosity there. It was they were just, kind to you as a beginner. Some of them were, some of them weren't. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. one of the guys who was probably the most dickish of the lot <laughs> actually turned out to be uh, a guy that I spent almost two years with. Mm -hmm. And I think my electrical ability today and my skill with tools and stuff would be different. You know, I, I mean, I, the, the, and he became a friend, now, right? So was it was he, like he was... He was he, demanding with you? He was very demanding especially at, right out of the gate. I mean, he told me in no uncertain terms that if I was interested in learning, he'd be happy to teach me everything he wanted, but if not, you can he did not want leave to work right with you. now. Yeah. And he didn't quite say it that way. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and then he lit up a number seven cigarette, and we, we probably chatted for a while, and I went and got him a coffee, and about two years later, I was a, I think I was a better tradesman as a result of it. You know, yeah. I mean, I think, I know I was. Yeah. So, yeah. so I don't know, there's this, there, there, it's an interesting dynamic. And I've sure. worked with a lot of magicians over the years who have taught me things, and some are definitely better than others, it seems to me. You know, so you talked about that wisdom of yes. his father with his son. Sure. You know, which yes. also, to me, so yeah. tacit, so I guess, I guess, Marty, we don't have enough time to cover all this ground here, but it's no. a redefinition of knowledge to some degree, really, isn't it? I mean... Well, it, it is. It, it, Polanyi worked in medicine first and then physical chemistry. And uh, he came from a family that was interested in socialism. And, and something about his scientific career 
with the family questions about economics and social structures led him into the study of economics and then from economics into philosophy and philosophy into theology and then late in life he got into aesthetics and um, he felt deeply the power of freedom at every at every level you know mm -hmm. there's degrees large degrees of freedom even in physical chemical reactions you put reactants together and they don't all go down the pathway you desire you're always going to have things freely happening that's a lot <laughs> like life <laughs> yeah off in the boundaries it's and, an existentialist position right. in life frankly isn't it and you can't he, he, he showed many many times that you can't have a centrally planned economy there are too many decisions that have to be made for to have it all go through the center and come back from the center as a command structure and he himself was taught and he himself was a teacher and in every area that he went from medicine physical chemistry economics philosophy theology aesthetics he was seeing the tacit dimension he felt the the power of that and the relief i don't have to prove everything i don't have to control everything i don't have to know everything in the sense of having an exact definition i can get along with approximations and intuitions and hunches and images that i know are not they're not perfect pictures, but they allow me to get a purchase. Oh, he called it contact with reality, to make contact with reality. And this is like the gold mine, right? Mm -hmm. If you can make contact with reality, it's like finding the right vein. And you just keep following that vein and mine it for all it's worth. And you don't know where it's going to end. I mean, you, you know, don't know in advance what you don't know. As you as you as you talk about it, I just the applications again. It's just it's you know I'm sure it's not sending shivers up my <laughs> listeners' spine, but it's just taking me down so many. It's just <laughs> you can hear it. I hope in my tone and my yeah, voice, but yeah. but I'm, I'm seeing the implications for something as simple as, and it's really actually not that simple, but as important and as relevant as being able to listen in a community that you go into in a country like. Burkina Faso or Mongolia oh. or Cambodia and to sit down and to say what a can I learn yes. from these folks tacitly yes. and now I better shut the hell up while I try to get a sense for what actually is going on you have to dwell in their You've framework got to dwell in their framework to get to the position where you right. don't come in with this arrogant kind of white western right. I got it all sorted oh, out no. Right, no. so the implications are just I mean no. and making contact with reality I can't think of a better field yeah. than to make contact with reality. And, yeah. and yeah. that is the, the, you know, trying to solve this problem of extreme poverty yeah. of all sorts. And you know, the, the, the things that frustrate the Western plans and programs mm. frequently are from the tacit dimension. Hmm. So a culture has got tacit dimension to it. Sure. All these assumptions. Well, there's levels, right? Yeah, these visions of reality, expectations, social expectations that are not on the surface and the westerner comes in and says these people need toilets i'm going to install western style toilets i'm going to impose and then install yeah yeah <laughs> or the other way around yeah and doesn't understand and and I, I just i just read about this once you know that someone came in and put all of these western style to toilets in india and the people didn't like them they yep. they preferred they, they had a taste for whatever their more primitive yes. methods were which Preferred were not as hygienic and and they they lacked our motivation I, I i guess knowing what people don't know in the tacit dimension for us raised in western culture if you say it's got germs ick stay away from from the time the kids are little that's right yeah they're raised by their parents of course so that you get an instinctive intuitive knee-jerk reaction oh if it's germy i'm not going to touch it that's right yeah well there's something profoundly ideological about that right it's like right, right at the root level it's, it's a yeah. whole world view yeah. yeah very much because so. you yeah. can't see the germs that's right you can only yeah. know yeah. them by indwelling our framework of 
medicine, what the body is, what a germ is, what health and what sickness are. Yes. Right. Yeah. And all of that's communicated from parent to child, and 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 by many different means in our culture, yeah, sure, in schools, sure. cartoons, yep. everything. But you go to another culture where we know that they are suffering from the you know pathogens that are related to human waste. And they do not share our whole emotional, passionate desire to be clean. Yeah, and to hand, be well, hand, hand washing. Right? Oh, just hand washing alone is is a profound problem. Right. Or clean water. Clean water. Well, same wh- thing. Why, wh- why would I use a water filter when I can just go to the river and drink it? And I right. mean that's changing. Yeah. Um, and, and I guess in a sense you could actually call that articulate knowledge, couldn't you? I mean that it, it is. It is. Okay, because we can we can define all of the pathogens that cause right. every we we right. know we see pictures of them. This causes that. Right. This cause, and this is how you get rid of it. How do you how do you how do you get clean yeah, water? Something very geometric and mathematical about What that. kind of what kind of do you heat it? Do you expose it to ultraviolet light? Do you filter it? You know, what what does it take starting with this as a source here in India to produce clean water for these villagers? We can put all of that into writing, and we can draw rules and regulations and how do you run your water purification plant. And if the people at the tacit level don't care, it's, <laughs> about, it's an off, for, for them it's an awful lot of work. Like yeah. you say, I'm yeah. just going to go down to the river and, and, yeah. and why, slake my thirst. Why, why bother? Yeah. 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 And, and we, we don't see, we don't recognize that we, we don't share this gut feeling. For the desire for clean water. Do you do you think this idea of Polanyi's, this idea of tacit knowing, and 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 a paraphrase of his for things of which we know we cannot tell, mm-hmm. which is something that's resonated with me on just so many levels right. for so many years. Right. I mean, his one I, of his. I know more than I can tell. I, I know more than I can tell. And it's the, there. It's it's. And everything it's here I say, in my everything gut. I say, there's more meaning to the words that I use than even I know. Right. When I when I really have struck that vein and made contact with reality. I'm talking about really important things. There's surplus meaning in my right. words that I cannot define. Do you think his work, I mean, it seems to me that more people are paying attention to his work. <laughs> seem to be more Well, you and books. I are. Yes. <laughs> and our friends. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But I wonder, you know, he was ignored to, to some degree at Oxford, you know, he he's, felt yes. Okay, he felt, okay. He felt ignored. He felt ignored. Yeah. Um, and now that's part of um, his lack of apprenticeship. Interesting. As a philosopher, academic, yeah, philosopher. Yeah, yeah. He, he he was trained classically as a medical doctor, trained classically as a physical chemist, but then he was self-educated as an economist, a philosopher, theologian, and then someone you know proposing a theory of aesthetics. Yeah. And he didn't understand the Oxford milieu. Uh, it's a school of snipers. <laughs> Everybody at Oxford is just ready to shoot down any idea that you send up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they are exquisitely well trained at detecting the weaknesses in an argument. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And if you can survive there, <laughs> It's sort of like, you know, you're you're cleansed, you're cleansed, and purified yes. by a, the experience. It's a, it's a hazing of a sort. Polanyi made this discovery about tacit knowing, personal knowledge, and and he saw the destructiveness of a different philosophy of science, where real knowledge is when you can put it into words and right. you can define it and you can prove it. He saw how this was destroying the Soviet Union. He saw how it was threatening Europe, and he felt that he had made a breakthrough and saying there's another kind of knowledge, more fundamental, more creative, more powerful. And he expected adulation. (laughs) He expected to be famous as the man who upended the Enlightenment and set out a new foundation. He went to Oxford and he got peppered by these sharpshooters. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And he didn't he he had didn't have a, an older mentor i mean he he was well on in, in years himself and didn't have someone who took him by the hand and yeah, to walk perhaps him, to walk him through it perhaps he wasn't ready at that time in his life to be an apprentice again to say look this is all right this is this is how they um honor you 
They, right, they, sure. They take on your some thought level. seriously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. And they shoot holes in it. Yeah, no, that's... And it's, it doesn't mean they don't like you or don't appreciate you, but your job now is go check out those holes that they've exposed. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And come back and stand up to them. So know. let's go... Uh, I want to talk about a, a letter I believe he wrote, or at least a very short article he wrote way back called The Value of the Inexact... It that just was me. I mean, it's, like 1934 or 1936, somewhere around there. And it was there. a page, wasn't it? A page and a half? Very uh, if, short. If even that. If uh, even that. A paragraph or two at the and most. And I'm pretty sure you talk about that in the book, uh, don't did you? Did it make it into the book? I thought it did. <laughs> it might it's, have been been a, a, it's been a few years since no, I read it. But I think that was one of the things that I wished ah, okay. I had put in the book. Because it's it's well, there's the, something profoundly beautiful about it's the title. germ exactly yes. the germ. It's, it's yeah. the germ of his philosophy of tacit personal knowledge. He's writing as a chemist, as a physical chemist, to a um, journal of uh, chemistry, and he says that it's not possible to do chemistry with the mindset that. Everything we, we have to do is going to be precise and that we're going to know in advance what's going to happen. He says the chemist is constantly coping with mm. things that you didn't expect. <laughs> That's now, great. There, there's That's no... a great phrase. The chemist is constantly coping with things you didn't expect. Right. It's great. Because you can't get pure chemicals. Right. Any, any sample you take is going to have almost every element in the periodic table in it. You, you can reduce them. But um, because of this tiny, tiny percentage of contamination, anytime you mix two chemicals, reactions are going to take place that are completely ridiculous, you know, among these subsidiary yes, yeah. extra chemicals. I would think so, yeah. yeah. And the, the good chemist just ignores the residue and says, I'm not bothered. Okay, I, I, I got 90, 95% of what I expected to get out of this reaction, and I'm going to pour off that right. into a flask right. And, right. and wash out the residue and throw it away. Right. Once in a while, once in a while, paying attention to the residue is the right thing to do. And you can't say, I know exactly when I should pay attention to the unexpected and, and, and see that it... Um, is testimony or evidence against my hypothesis. Or, at another time, to say, that's just one of those things that happens with chemicals and it's not worth spending any time on. That's an inexact judgment. And a chemist who can't be at ease with these, these undefinable, uncontrollable aspects of chemistry is not going to be a good chemist. It sounds like you're talking, you know, it really sounds like you're talking about relationships of various sorts, you know, so the way to make contact with reality is by attending to these relationships, the variety of relationships that we, we all are a part of each and every day, whether it's with the crossing guard or whether it's the fellow scientists in the lab or whether it's with the chemicals themselves the, and so on. Uh, there's something for me uh, to, in my uh, world and development and so on, and, and as a performer and speaker and teacher, to sort of, I don't want to reduce everything to relationship, but I don't know if there's a downside to that. You well, know? I, I think... What am I bringing to it? Right. What am I going to take from it? Right. How do I open the whole idea of listening, yeah. you know, of validating the other, you know, not, not yeah. de demonizing the other. You know right. what I mean? It's Yeah, Polanyi has... Uh, kind of a, a hierarchy of being. And he talks about how our participation in what we know becomes more complex with the higher level of being that we are knowing. So at the low level, when I'm relating to inorganic mm -hmm. materials, I'm not deeply involved in what they are doing. Right. right? And, right. and it's all, they're, they're passive to me. Then we come up to uh, organic living things, get in, into the field of biology and zoology and the observation of animals, the thing that Conrad Lorenz did, the sympathetic uh, investigation, maybe they call it ethology, sympathetic hmm. investigation of animals in their environment where you try to 
understand their natural behavior. Now I'm much more involved, and there's a dialogue between me and the animals, understanding the purposes of their behavior, and recognizing in the animals something that is very much like myself. Hunger, thirst, fear, anger, um, all kinds of desire in in the animals, a desire for a mate, uh, maybe even loneliness, the animals can grieve. Come up to the next higher level, come to human beings, and I'm completely uh, in, in very in a very complex way. Now, I and thou are in a dialogue, two centers of freedom, hmm. extremely complex. You know, with the animals, I'm still at a at a higher level, and there's a degree of passivity in my observation of them or any experiments that I do with them that is not the case when it is I and another human being, uh, you know, a fellow center of awareness, a center of knowing, tacit and articulate. And then Polanyi even looked upward to the heavens. Many of his books, it's really quite striking how, how often, after talking about... Uh, how we know what we know, a branch of philosophy called epistemology, talking about science and the philosophy of science. Um, he uh, would end by saying, and my understanding of tacit personal knowledge opens the door to faith in God. And he hoped that his grasp of the inexact that which we have to cope with by guess and by golly, by intuition and feeling and hunches, my, my thinking about the nature of faith that we have to have to make a commitment to take steps where we don't know how they're going to turn out, this is going to open the door to a resurgence of religion. And then he's looking upward at a transcendent, some kind of transcendent being, he called it God. He used the word. Also transcendent ideals like truth and right, beauty right. and goodness um, that are above us and that, that we are under. That, that, that we are, we, I think he does say here we do need to be humble. Maybe you're a uh, master in uh, the field of... Um, the electrical skills, you know, didn't didn't seem humble at first. Right, right. But 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 here, we have to let these higher, the higher being, the higher power, the higher ideals regulate our decisions. We are not creating them. We're subject to these, and we strive with an intention to meet the standards of these greater transcendent realities. So um, we're going to have to wrap it up soon for the formal part of the sure. interview, and we can keep chatting for quite, quite a while. <laughs> hours longer, and I'm hours. Sure. Oh, yeah, without a doubt. But I need to address this, and I wanted to talk about it earlier. I mean, I love that this whole idea of participation, yes. you know, making contact with reality, this idea of indwelling. I mean, it's wonderful relational stuff, and, it, yeah. and I hope a few listeners out there are going to pick up, pick up your book. They're going to dig a little deeper and, and find out what's going on about this whole idea of tacit knowing. Mm-hmm. But how is none of this just habit? If this is if this is about riding a bike or about hammering a nail or about you know um, working in a laboratory, how come? I mean, I wonder. I wonder some, to some degree if some of Polanyi's thinking has been ignored because philosophers um, have just said, "Ah, yeah, it's just you know when you hammer a nail, it's just habit. That's not knowledge." Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess... And therefore the, invalidate it. Right. They're thinking of habit as something that is um, common and of very little value. Mm. Whereas Polanyi would say the development of those habits and those skills is what puts us in a position to do something new. Okay, And now anything that's habitual is old and practiced. Right. right? Nice. Yeah. But if you see, there's this video of Michael Jordan, the great basketball player. It's only a, a few seconds, but he was going up for a layup 
and there's these tall men towering over him. And somehow or another, I guess he recognized in a split second that they were going to block the shot. And he switched the ball from his right hand to his left hand mm. and put it in from the other side of the basket. Right. It's the, the uh, ultimate I've, deke. I've watched it oh, and watched it yeah. and watched it. Now, clearly that's the culmination of tens of thousands of hours of mm -hmm. practice and training. And you could say, oh, it was just habit. But he had never made that move no. before in a game. No. And I don't yeah. think he ever made it again. A sense of discovery there, right? In the moment. In, in the moment, with the heat, with the audience, yes. with the cheers. I know, it's pretty remarkable, actually. Oh, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, of course, in and of itself, if you just think of piano playing as 10,000 hours of practicing, it, that sounds kind of dreary. It does, yes. Yeah. But for people who love the piano, they're not thinking of the 10,000 hours of practice that give them the habits that they need. They're thinking of the concert. Yeah, the concert yeah. hall, and I don't know. Okay, no offense to any listeners, but I, I think of Rachmaninoff as a challenging composer, you know. And when I hear someone really give themselves completely to something that he's done, it's it's a it's a staggering performance. Mm -hmm. And I don't care that they've memorized it. Right. <laughs> I don't right. care right. that they practice. I don't a hundred times. Uh, uh, yeah. I have no idea how long it takes because sure. sure. I'm not that kind of person. I don't have that training. I don't have that background. I don't care that it's a matter of habit. In the moment, they are giving themselves completely to me, using the piano as sure. an instrument of communicating a vision that Rachmaninoff had, and it's it, it, it just carries you away. It's glorious. How does this tacit knowing thing um, change my life? Like, how does it affect the the school teacher how does it affect the construction worker how does it affect the the politician the oh. lawmaker etc i mean I, I i'm starting to see implications for this stuff all over but i've been thinking about it and reading about it and writing about it for years yeah. how how, yeah. how how do you win somebody over to say hey have you heard about tacit knowing let me tell you <laughs> and here's a reason why you need to pay more attention to it well uh it, it varies with each of those uh, skill sets that you're sure. talking about. Yep. What do they have in common? I think the, the, the great lesson is to relax. Go with the flow. Nice. Be at ease. Um, wait, wait, wait for the moment. Wait for the insight. With my classes... Um, I give them time. I just I, there are times when I just shut up and let them think, because I know it takes time for them to uh, run through the steps that lead to an answer or to assemble the associations. I ask them some mm. kind of question, or we're talking about some kind of topic, and I just have to let them process it and trust that. There's something happening inside of them that will eventually lead them to speak. With the uh, construction, <laughs> there are times when you should just have to sit down. You've, you've hit some some problem you didn't foresee when you started out building this hip roof, you know, and and things are coming together at odd angles, and you're saying, how the heck do I get that piece in there, and how do I fasten it so it won't fall down? And how do I meet the requirements of the code mm -hmm. given these materials and this much time and this much money, you know? And you don't want to take things apart, you know. But you've you've mm -hmm. built yourself into mm -hmm. a corner. Mm -hmm. You just sit and look at it. Uh, have you ever read the book Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance? I have. That's a that's an old reference for me. That's a long time ago now. Yeah, very yeah, long. Yeah, I, yeah. I read it as a kid when it, it first came out, and uh, there's some of that advice sure. in there. Sure. Sure. You know. And uh, Polanyi was not an Eastern thinker. He never, that I know, have mentioned Zen at all. But I, I see his philosophy of tacit knowing hooking up with this tremendous practical common sense of the Zen practitioners. You know, just be there. And, and don't keep hammering away at what is in, in the immediate focus of your attention. 
you know, the, the statement of the problem. Try, try to loosen up, you know, uh, shake your, your hands out. Right, sure, uh, sure. Step back. Get, get perspective. Get perspective. Get perspective. Yeah. You know, whether it's a human conflict, you know, you can talk yourself into a corner with human beings. And uh, there are times when the best thing to do is nothing. And when there's nothing to do, do nothing with great confidence. <laughs> Just <laughs> what a great what a great way to wrap it up formally. <laughs> Father uh, Martin Molesky, professor of religious studies and Catholic theology at Kinesis College, and um, talking about the value of the inexact and tacit knowing and, and uh, new visions of reality. And author of Michael Polanyi, scientist and philosopher. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure.